Today on Straight Talk Africa, we bring you a special presentation, Autism, Breaking the Silence, with the guest host, Lino Modu. Hello, welcome to a special presentation of Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters in Washington. I am your host, Lenore Moudou. Today, the Voice of America brings you a town hall on autism with the theme, Breaking the Silence. We are joined by a panel of experts who have gathered here in Washington studio to discuss a complex developmental disorder that impairs the ability of children and adults to communicate and interact. We also have a live audience, including families and advocates who are participating in today's conversation. Since we have a live studio audience, well, we will not be taking your telephone calls for today's television show and radio and the internet. However, joining us, we have four distinguished guests, and they are Susan Daniels. She is the director of the Office of Autism Research Coordination at the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Health, based here in the nation's capital. We also have Dr. Usifo Edward Ashisha, he is Clinical Director of the International Training Center for Applied Behavior Analysis, located in Lagos, Nigeria. The center offers education training and neurobehavioral intervention services for people with autism, traumatic brain injuries, and other developmental disabilities. Also joining us is Tracy Freeman. She is a holistic physician based in Washington, D.C., with a practice that incorporates a traditional and complementary, as well as alternative medicine to help children with autism spectrum disorders and their families. She also serves as the chief medical advisor at BBNR Wellness Consulting. Last but certainly not least is Morenike Jiwa Onaiwu. Morenike, who is on the spectrum, is the Autism and Race Committee Chair for the Autism Women's Network. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's fantastic to have you. Well, guys, well, before we begin today's discussion, let's watch this overview of autism and how it affects individuals and their families. The condition is emerging as an open conversation in some parts of the world. Take a listen. My son was having some behavioral issues in school and we didn't know what it was. We just knew he was struggling, he was having a tough time. Levi was saying hi and bye and kitty and tree. And right about the same time he started walking, he just stopped. Any sort of communication just went away around 16 months. The symptoms may differ. However, Odaiche Onyeke and Megan Dahlberg's sons have the same condition, autism spectrum disorder. Autism affects the brain's normal development. As a result, children and adults with autism have difficulty interacting socially, communicating and controlling their behavior. Over the years, autism has puzzled researchers, challenged therapists and left many families with unanswered questions, such as, what causes autism? There's been a lot of research on the cause. Uh, we know what's not doesn't cause it. Vaccines do not cause it. There's questions of environment. There's questions of, of the genetic makeup of someone. But the actual cause is an unknown. Scott Badesh is the president of the Autism Society of America. He says there have been some improvements in addressing the condition over the years, such as more global awareness. However, many challenges remain. It, there's a problem, and I would argue it's probably worldwide, that when you look at statistics about who gets diagnosed, uh, poor people get diagnosed later, which then slows the ability of treatment. If you look at it as a, from a parent perspective or, or someone who has to be involved in the care and the support of a family, there's a mixed bag. There, there, there's more services today than ever before, but there's nowhere near the services needed for, for all who need help. It, it, autism is also a civil rights issue. And that's universal, that um, if, when you have 70% of adults with autism being underemployed or unemployed, 
Well, that means they're living on wages below poverty. The World Health Organization says globally, one in 160 children has autism. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one in 68 children has autism in the United States. This includes one in 42 boys compared to one in 189 girls. Observers say reliable data is hard to find for low- and middle-income countries, including those in sub-Saharan Africa. Overcoming the stigma of autism is another difficult challenge. So is awareness. Onyeke agrees. It's very important for the African community to know that this disorder exists in our community and that it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to get help for your child. I think we need to um, just learn about what the symptoms are, what the signs are. You have grown adults living with autism that have no idea that they have autism. There is no cure for autism, but there are treatments to help children and adults improve the condition. And treatment depends on each person's specific needs. Until it becomes possible to answer questions such as the exact cause of autism or why more boys than girls seem to be affected, parents like Levi's mother live with hope, celebrating each milestone. And again, time, thanks to, to all of you for joining us. So I want to start with the whole understanding of autism because it brings so much confusion out there, when, whether you talk to therapists, you talk to parents, and even some people don't even know what it is. They have never heard of it. So autism has evolved over the years when it comes to definition. Dr. Daniels, can you define for us currently what is autism? So in the DSM-5 statistical manual on mental disorders, um, the definition is based on social behavioral communication issues and repetitive behaviors, but often autism presents with co-occurring intellectual disabilities and language disabilities as well. And this accounts for the dramatic difference in symptoms across different people with autism depending on which domains are most affected. So it is a spectrum which goes from low functioning, this is a term we hear very often, to high functioning. Dr. Ashisha, can you give us a, a clarity in terms of what that means? If we say low functioning and high functioning, before the DSM-4 was transformed to DSM-5, there was a subset called Asperger's. That group is referred to as high functioning up there because the major problem with them is social interaction. There's absence of communication problems. They can communicate, but the problem is that they cannot socially interact appropriately, even up to adulthood. That is a fundamental problem. And they cannot hold on to a job. They, they cannot, uh, uh, they can take care of themselves quite okay, do activities of daily living, but they cannot hold on to a job. That that and, us, yeah, that and they cannot maintain long-lasting relationship. Okay. So. Okay. So let me come to you, Morenike, because you are a person who is living with autism, and your story is so fascinating in the sense that you did not even know you had autism. You were a grown woman with children, and you took your daughter to get diagnosed. That's when you were told perhaps you should think about yourself in terms of being diagnosed. Tell us how this came about and, and what it means for you to be, to, to be on the spectrum. Certainly. Um, and I'd like to preface by saying that I know that in the, um, that typically in the um, disability community, a lot of diagnoses are referred to using person-first language. Um, I personally, as a proponent of neurodiversity, of the different types of minds that are natural within the, the human, you know, human beings, um, prefer to use identity first language. So I refer to myself as an autistic person. Um, it's a part of my identity. And um, as you mentioned, growing up, I was not aware that I was autistic. I knew that I was different than other people, but I wasn't really certain why. Um, in my home, we just kind of rolled with it. <laughs> it was just kind of the way it was. And we just kind of worked with the strengths that I had, supported the challenges. And so there were, I, I didn't really have a, a name or an awareness of what this thing was that made me 
um, different than my peers. Um, and so when I, I have both biological and adopted children, and my daughter, um, I have a, my youngest two children are, are autistic as well. When my daughter um, was attending a Mother's Day Out program when she was two years old, it was the staff there um, who mentioned, wow, your daughter can't do this or can't do this or can't do this. I was like, sure she can. She can do all that stuff. And they were like, well, no, she's not doing it in class and she's different than the other children. And she was, I was like, she's just like the way I was when I was a kid. Whoops, she's fine. And so I observed her one day through their eyes and not my own and um, noticed that she did, her peers were, you know, the way they moved and spoke was different than the way she did. And I actually thought they seemed weird, frankly, kind of yeah. loud. and. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so forth, and a little dramatic, but um, that started the process of going to our pediatrician, um, taking the MCHAT to be screened, and then going for, through a variety of different um, evaluations to rule out what might be happening. And um, uh, eventually, as we proceeded through the process, a comprehensive process, she was diagnosed, and later on, my son as well. And in working closely with the professionals and answering the questions, and really being and researching and being really confused as to what they were looking for. Um, so many similarities were um, identified that it was recommended that I, um, you know, go for an evaluation as an adult. And it's not atypical for a lot of women, um, as well as non-binary individuals, to be diagnosed late because we, um, it isn't recognized as easily in us, and particularly people of color. Of course. And uh, let's talk about uh, something that is very important because we receive a comment from one of our viewers. And he asked, how does autism compare to someone who is <coughs> unstable? And it, it really comes to the question of mental illness versus autism, which is said to be a developmental disorder. So can you make that distinction for us? Uh, to, does, is there a point where autism will be considered a mental illness, or is it a distinction, a clear distinction, and we should never make that confusion? So autism is a developmental disorder. Um, it starts, the, the, the evidence is there that it begins before birth, mm -hmm. um, that they can detect so early signs of autism in prenatal development. And so children are already on a trajectory toward autism when they're born. Um, with many mental illnesses, they don't appear until later in life and can be affected by many experiences that people have in life. Okay. So, Dr. Freeman, tell us about some of the red flags. Uh, you are a mother of a, a son with autism, but you are also a service provider to families and, and people who have autism. What are some of the red flags that we should look for? So, it's a lack of eye contact is one of the main things. Um, early on, you, even as a baby, they won't actually look at you in your, in your eye. Also, um, they'll be sound sensitive and work very hard to find different maneuvers <laughs> to kind of protect themselves from the noises in the environment. Even when, in my experience and other children I've seen, even when you feel like the world is quiet, <laughs> then there's still like something that they perceive is too loud. And so by definition, <laughs> autism is that you cannot socialize. It means you're into yourself. And so you, if you are social, you are by definition not autistic. That is the cornerstone and has always been since they first diagnosed it, the cornerstone of autism. I think it's interesting when you say something about being into yourself because I consider myself, for example, as someone who's introvert. So at what point do you start thinking, perhaps you should think about autism or if you have a loved one who will behave a certain way, you have to think about it. Given that it is a spectrum, some people are high functioning, Morenike did not think about herself as being on the step spectrum. So Dr. Ashisha, could you perhaps uh, comment? Thank you. The early signs, well, the parents need to observe, so one, when you have a baby at the age of 12, the baby cannot babble, then that's a signal. At the age of 12, the baby cannot grasp no gesture, no, not waving, that's a sign. Then at the age of 16, the child cannot say some words. Then at the age of 24, no two word phrase, phrases. And at that moment, you have lots of social skills, like she said, eye contact, and uh, the moment you've received that flag, 
that does not actually diagnose autism right now. It's just early signs a mother. They will okay. take a mother to, to make a determination that the child needs evaluation. Okay. That's, that's good to know. So we will continue this discussion. So much to talk about. And uh, we want to remind you that today's special presentation of Straight Talk Africa on autism is streaming live on the web at voaafrica.com and on Facebook. To watch our show, just enter the keywords at Straight Talk Africa. And we are tweeting live. Follow us on my Twitter handle. It's at Linor Moudou. And joining on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Talk Autism. And we'll air some of your comments later in the show. Now, let's hear from Fariyo Abdul Qadir, a Somali mother in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who is breaking the silence on her struggle to determine if her son was on the autism spectrum. And then we saw him eating stuff, like a lot of sensory issue, and he wasn't naming people, like, he forgot his, to say his grandpa, his sister's names, like so many things he forgot. And then we're like, oh no, he just came from Africa, it's been 20 days, like give him time, he maybe forgot all this stuff. He, then my husband was not convinced, he's like, no, how do you forget 20 days just traveling, coming back, like people's names. Then we went, we followed up with the, for his 24 month checkup with the doctor, that's like almost like a month, you know, later with different doctor, different city, we moved to Egan at the time. And so he said, oh, nothing is wrong. He's just being too, he's running around, you know, just experiencing eating stuff from the ground. It's not a big deal. So I, I still felt comfortable. I said, okay, the doctor said this, so I'm gonna believe what the doctor said. But my husband was still saying, no, the doctor doesn't know everything. You know, sometimes you know your child, you need to do your own research. So let's discuss, uh, continue our discussion. We will take some uh, questions from the audience, but first, Morinika, you just you wanted to add something? Yes, I did want to mention that um, there, there definitely is the discussion, the talk of autism being a spectrum, and certainly there's a lot of um, individual variation in all human beings. All right. And so, um, as was referred to earlier, that currently, um, since the DSM-5, um, the diagnosis is autism spectrum disorder, whereas previously it had um, there were various different um, conditions that were all part of the spectrum. Um, there are a lot of us in the um, autistic community that um, prefer not to use functioning labels, um, such as low functioning, high functioning, because um, in a sense, um, aside from the fact that it's a, it's a vestige of the DSM-4, it's also a difficult thing to determine. Um, people, people, all human beings have support needs, and so there is a saying by um, an, an advocate that when you are low functioning, your strengths are ignored. When you are high functioning, your um, challenges are ignored. So essentially, we want to kind of look at the fact that all people on the spectrum present in different ways, but um, not to have a hierarchy in terms Absolutely. of high or low. Um, also, I, I do want to mention that the socialization is different. It's not necessarily that we don't socialize. We may not socialize in the same way or in the same quantities as you very all want to. <laughs> very, very good point yeah. indeed. And uh, let's, talk, uh, let's talk to our audience now. The first question, uh, do we have a question? Yes, that's a question right there. Well, for me, it's more of a statement. Uh, full disclosure, um, my name is Bernadette, and uh, I own a behavioral health center. And actually, I'm a, a PhD scholar here in Washington, D.C. for ABA. And right now, in my center, what I'm trying to do, um, actually, uh, Ms. Ifoma here, she's my partner. And we have a special room that we're creating for ABA services. The good thing is now Medicaid is paying for that. And um, I like what you just said, uh, that uh, it's not that they don't socialize. All of us, we are shaped and we're conditioned to behave. So with autistic children, it's the same thing. It's just they speak a language that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of meeting them at their point of need I have a brother that died because he had autism. So I vowed to myself as a kid that I'll find a way to help people. And one of my, my, my biggest uh, fight now, to God be the glory, I have a partner that works with me. 
um, is to make sure that we have special care for Af especially for African women yeah. and, and um, have group um, we create in group therapies because as you can tell many of our African women when they have children with autism they automatically get a divorce from the husband mm -hmm. because the children are labeled as devils mm -hmm. and they're not uh, diagnosed and not given treatment mm -hmm. and I have worked with children I go to schools and do uh, be part of uh, IEP Bernard, I'm going to interrupt you because you 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 have so many important points that yes. you are you are mentioning, yes. and we want to make sure we don't miss out on them. Okay. So we're going to to stop you right there uh -huh. and and come back to you because we're going uh, we're going to talk about this Africa okay. and how it's affecting the the, the African community. These are su such good points, and we want to know more about the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for this uh, question. So I would like someone to comment, Dr. Ashisha. Perhaps you can start with the impact of autism in the African community. Well, okay, thank you. Before we talk about that mm -hmm. just briefly we be so burdened with the issue of diagnosis of autism parents we see in Africa they come around us to establish whether their child belongs to the spectrum or not and even when they come to the US or different countries and they have that diagnosis either from a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a, a behavior analyst they still come over shopping from one agency to the other to be told, just to be reassured that what Dr. A said is correct. That is one major challenge. Number two, when they come out there, they are searching for cure right away. Because yeah. they believe in medical model of treatment. It's like you have a headache, you take Tanala, it goes. That is one major problem again with particularly African people out there. And thirdly, some will say, oh, how can my child do what the parents are able to do? As said by the, um, Mr. Nairo, Nairo. That is important too. Then again, because out there, services are not paid for by the government, mm -hmm. neither subsidized. They will ask you, what is the cost? Mm -hmm. They just bring a child to you. Yeah. I'm told that my child is uh, belong to the spectrum. Can you manage? How much is it going to cost? It's just issue of cash and carry. Yes. And uh, no question is either asked at all about how can I support the intervention process you, the provider of services, is giving. For example, if you went, if you went to send a therapist home, spend only four hours, then the remaining hours is left for mom and dad to, you know. So transfer of technology that they'll be able to know what the registered behavior technician is doing with the child. Then when she goes away and the child is, child is presenting with challenging behavior, they should be able to do one or two things. They have some fundamental area. And again, if you now say, you <coughs> want to do assessment, say no. He's been seen by Dr. A. He told me that he's autism. So what kind of assessment? There are two aspects of assessment or diagnosis you're going to make. Clinical diagnosis that will establish that this child is in the spectrum or some other, he has low IQ, very bad. That's okay. Like I said before, if a child is in the spectrum and you are told that is it, is that the end of the story? The mother goes home? No. Yeah, what so next? this leads, leads <coughs> so, us to the second aspect of yes. diagnosis very quickly, and that is what do you do with the child next? What do you do? Right, after he, he or she has been diagnosed. Yes. Right, so, so, so now let's talk about uh, treatment. Okay, and I don't know if one of you want to add a little more on diagnosis. Uh, to, after. I need to uh, okay. just a little, very a little briefly. And then yes, we'll, very brief. Yes. The issue is that diagnosis for clinical functional is that will lead you to what should be done next. Yes. Absolutely. How to take the child from point A to point B. That is the essence of that assessment. What is Bobby able to do now? At what is what is his level? He cannot do this like he's paid. Therefore, how do we move him from? From point A to, to, to point B. Okay. And, Very and, briefly, yes, um, with regard to diagnosis, I think one, and I acknowledge that um, although I, I am African, my family is Nigerian and, and also from Cabo Verde, um, but being raised here in the U.S. and living here, um, one, there's privilege that we have um, that everyone does not have. And so when we're thinking about the African community, some of the hallmarks of autism, the eye contact thing, well, when we think about a lot of African cultures, it's, it's customary not to make direct eye contact. 
right. It's rude. Right. So you weren't, that's not going to be a red flag. In terms of not babbling, well, you know, we speak when we have something to say. We don't just talk to hear ourselves talk. So a child not putting words together may not also be odd. So in some cases, things may not be, you know, certain things culturally may be missed because of the way the diagnostic criteria are viewed through Western standards. Very good point. Very good point there. And Dr. Daniels, what are what is the typical diagnosis? Where does the process start? I would assume a lot of time is the pediatrician with the pediatrician. What what is the the process? Well, sometimes parents will identify signs mm. early and they'll talk with their pediatrician. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes. caregivers in preschool or. Okay. Um, in a care setting, we'll identify it and tell the parents and, and they'll see a pediatrician. Uh, diagnosis can be done by age two, and there are signs that can be detected much earlier, but um, the actual definitive diagnosis can't really be done accurately until age two. But most kids aren't diagnosed by then, and many are diagnosed much later, um, which precludes them from getting early intervention. Okay, and we're here trying to understand autism. And I have a question for you, Maureen Ike, very briefly. Yes. I see you shaking something in your hand. Yes. Can you share with us why you're doing that and what is, why it's important to you? Certainly. Um, so there's pretty much nowhere that I, don't, that I go that I don't have a, a stimming device or stimming toy. So I'm... Um, Autistic children grow up to be autistic adults. This is one of the ones, this is actually given to me by a friend, Leah Kelly. It was a Christmas decoration that she repurposed for me. Um, as a person who is autistic, um, I can, you know, it helps to calm me or it, it's a good, it, it's in terms of sensory, the stimulation that this provides me, um, this and other things, you know, sometimes you might see me rocking. I have some things that I do in my head quietly or, you know, like things that I'm, that are kind of running through my head, song lyrics or words or phrases I'm repeating. This kind of helps me navigate in the neurotypical world. Like to you all, this is comfortable sitting up on the, I'm not saying being in the camera, but sitting in a room with people socializing small talk, neurotypical people like that. Autistics, we hate that crap. So, <laughs> so this helps me to well, function. Well, that's good to know. Yes. So. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for explaining that to us. So now we have a Facebook question, and uh, our viewer Omonua Okubo from Abuja in Nigeria asks, I want to know the signs and symptoms of autism. Also, I'd like to know the causes and the best way to avoid autism. So I think we touched on the signs and symptoms of autism. This is not like uh, a code like sure. that I'm fighting right now, that, you know, where you can avoid Avoid it, or you have signs, and and uh, so let's talk. I think I, we're going to take the last part of this question, where um, it talks about. It talks about avoiding autism. It's not even, you know, I, I I don't think it's even possible. But I think the the bigger question here is, if we if we don't know the cause we know some of the risk factors, right? And we went over those risk factors. So let's talk about parents will have, perhaps one of the parents have autism. Should they be more uh, watchful of their child? Um, perhaps with that, Absolutely. how is that? Yes, yeah, so if a, one of the parents is on the autism spectrum, there is a higher chance that their children may also be on the autism spectrum, and so they should be vigilant. Okay. So okay. Like she said, there's, genetic, yes, Dr. Freeman? there's some genetic loading, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Dr. Freeman, you were if saying? If you have a sibling, if you have one, your first child or another child has autism, then there's a 25% chance yes. the next child will have autism as well. So in that case, you really get a chance to observe and be on top of it. Yeah. Very, very important. All right, let's remind our, list, our audience that you are tuned into a special edition of Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of our Autism Town Hall discussion in a moment. But again, let's hear from Wilberforce Otieno, a single father from Mombasa, Kenya, who breaks his silence about his son's excelling, excelling in school despite being on the autism spectrum disorder. And so I took him to a normal school. He stayed there for a while. And after some time, they asked me to take him to Pandya Hospital. And when I took him there, then they advised me to take him to a primary school uh, that uh, caters for kids who have a uh, mental handicap. But he had problems there because he was so restless. They didn't understand him. You know, they would beat him um, because they thought he was a violent kid. Sometimes even adults will think that this kid is just being rough on the other children. They beat him up. He's a quiet kid. He's smart when he gets something he really remembers. 
In school, he performs so well. Most times, he's actually at the top of his class. He comes with uh, many awards. He has talents. You know, as I told you, when he gets something, he will never forget. One of the challenges that I can say I've faced, mostly it's because they tell us that he shouldn't, for example, eat wheat, milk, shouldn't eat sugar. And, and those are the things that we eat. Those are the things that are found here. And Dr. Freeman, I come right to you because he talks about food and <laughs> what he's supposed to eat and not to eat. So you come from the alternative uh, perspective. What do you tell your patients and what is, what is the guideline in your practice? So I, in general for all patients, there's bio-individuality, right? So what's good for one person isn't good for the next. And so it's worth doing a try. It, genetically, we know now that something like two-thirds of the world's population does not digest milk. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to take it out and see does that impact a child. Because if you are doing or eating something that is at all inflammatory to your body, then you are going to behave differently if you can't express. That do doesn't feel good to me. Mm -hmm. So the, if you want the child, it's worth a try. A milk, if you take it away in a week, you'll know, is this a problem or not? The child will settle down. Gluten, some people can't tolerate that either. A lot of these children have gastrointestinal problems. And so if you take it away, that takes a little longer to see change. But nonetheless, it's worth a try if it makes it so that they feel better. I know in my son's case, we removed gluten. He had his first formed stool in, in the diaper in his entire little life in a year and a half after in wow. three days. So it, it was visible, it was obvious that that wasn't a good idea for him. So I know one of the problems that people have with alternative or complementary medicine is uh, the lack of evidence-based, uh, you know, uh, so results. So what can you tell us in terms of um, where, when you say that it's each person is, is uh, unique, of course, that we know, we understand now about autism. But how do you determine what a child or an adult may need in terms of the dietary restrictions? So it's, it's trial and error, I'm afraid. So basically, um, you remove it and you observe. Even just like diagnosis, it's based on observation. So you just remove it and observe. If you don't see any changes, put it back. Sometimes you don't appreciate something until you put it back. Mm -hmm. Like you don't, you don't notice that, oh, that made a difference until you give it back and like, whoa, I didn't appreciate that. <laughs> He was calmer <laughs> without whichever food it is. Okay. But it's not, there's nothing I think that goes across the board for every person. It's just that um, there are a lot of people in general, autistic and otherwise, who don't tolerate these things. Uh, Dr. Ashisha, let's talk to, uh, talk to us about applied behavioral analysis, which is an approach that we hear a lot when it comes to addressing uh, the condition of, of, of people with, on autism, with autism rather. Talk to us about what is it and how does it differ from one person to another? Okay, uh, applied behavioral analysis is a specialized area of study that actually focuses on the understanding and of uh, the understanding of the behavior of children and their development, basically. Not only children, even adults. So that is that simply as ABCD. But you cannot actually practice it except you are properly trained. Yes, of course, there are a lot of people out there that are practicing ABA. I don't have any objection to that. You might actually be able to pick up one strategy and know it very well, you may not be satisfied so long as you can do it very well. Yes, good. So that is all about ABA. But the, your training should be based on the fact that one, most behaviors are learned. Two, uh, environment impacts behavior. Three, behaviors have function. Like my dear sister turning mm -hmm. right now. What is the function of that? She knows the function. Mm -hmm. I can modify that behavior now because the behavior is anything a man does. What purpose does that shaking serve her? Can you modify it? Yes, it can be modified instead of shaking in a public place where it may be deemed socially inappropriate. Follow me now. Mm -hmm. Then you can modify that. Then two. Skill deficit impact behavior. 
Like I said, environment also impacts behavior. And uh, teamwork, very, very critical. Yes. And relationship matters. Okay. This now, is the basis of ABA. Okay. okay. And Morenike, I, I wanted to get your uh, take on your, your experience, actually. Uh, what are you doing for yourself, very briefly, for yourself, what is working, and also perhaps for your daughter, given that you seem to have the same symptom, but we know that each person is different. Yes, and so, um, I, being that I was diagnosed late, and so I was misdiagnosed um, several times with different conditions, so I tried things like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, or things of that nature, um, that um, weren't as effective for me because they weren't, because really it wasn't that something was wrong with me, it was that I was different, I needed to learn to understand myself. Um, and a lot of the challenges that I had were trying to do things such as suppress myself to, you know, like I know it may not be socially acceptable to do this, but this calms me. This is better than having a meltdown in 20 minutes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable in my skin and owning who I am. But with regard to my, my children who are on the spectrum, with my daughter, we had her in what was deemed an ABA program, but um, a lot of what is called ABA today for billing purposes is not true ABA because essentially, you know, ABA is based on um, behaviorism, and there are, I and mean, we have, we can't ignore the fact that there are internal processes in all human beings that cannot be observed. Um, so um, there, I know we do have, there is evidence based um, research from 1987 from Lovas of ABA, but since then, the most, the, the gold standard, the, there was a randomized clinical trial, the um, Early Start Denver model, which was not, took some elements of ABA, but it implemented developmental education. It implemented natural, um, naturalistic education and doing things that are play-based and person-centered. And so, and it was only 20 hours per week and it was um, a lot of parental involvement. What we don't want is compliance-based treatment. So both my, my daughter had that type of program as well as occupational and speech therapy. My son went to a public price, a preschool for children with disabilities, occupational and speech therapy, that, and, but we didn't do a whole lot of it because ultimately you're not gonna, you want to improve upon your skills and you want to build your strengths, but you still need to be a kid. You still need to grow, we all develop. So you don't want to change into something that you're not, you don't want to spend your life it 40 hours, 60 hours a week in therapy, that's not a life. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're autistic, you're gonna be that way for the rest of your life. So it's about managing and whatever is best for the patient in particular. <laughs> now let's um, take some questions from the audience. Do we have a question? Okay, please hand him the mic. The gentleman in the back. Uh, my name is Tufa. I'm uh, the parent of an uh, autistic child. He's now 18. Um, this baby is my baby. He was born perfectly as a normal boy. Uh, he didn't have anything, meaning he was not born with a, disease, with a condition. Uh, from the commentary I saw earlier, um, one of the guys was saying he's completely ruling out the possibility of any uh, vaccine uh, involvement in this situation. I'm a healthcare provider too. Some parents come to me and ask me uh, about this thing, about vaccination. It's very hard to tell people definitely that this is not the case. And we are now looking at or reading um, what is going on around the world around, regarding research. And they are not ruling out the cause of vaccine as uh, a condition for this situation. Okay. Uh, can, can one of the uh, panelists over there comment on this? Very good question because you have these parents who say, listen, I saw my child doing well, singing, counting, and then as soon as they took the vaccine, they went mute. We cannot ignore what they saw. What do you tell them, Dr. Daniels, briefly? Certainly every parent's experience of seeing their child is valid. They've seen what they've, they've experienced with their child. However, research that has been conducted, um, funded by the NIH and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, to date has really suggested that vaccines do not have a link with autism, uh, that there are early signs of autism that may not be very apparent to people early on because they're subtle. And there are children who, who have regression. Some children with autism regress in certain areas of functioning yeah. and they don't really know why. So, um, and, people... and this may co also correlate with the age of vaccination. However, as I said, there's recent research that really suggests that you can see early signs far be before the age of two. Yeah, because some people also say it may not be the cause, but could it be a trigger? 
So how and do you respond? It's and so same, the, no, no the, research. So there's, there's no correlation found yes. in research it's, at this time. It's, it's, it's good to clarify that. Did you want to add no. something? No. Okay, great. So as we are yeah. on uh, research, you know, I wanted us to talk about research. However, before we do that, I wanted to go back to diagnosis and research. It, it, it is connected in a way. When we look at this, the, the data in the United States, one in 48, in 42 girls ha, ha, have autism as opposed to one in 189 boys. No, I think it's the opposite. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> one in 189 boys. No, I, one in 42 boys. It's more boys than girls. That's the yes. point I'm trying to make, <laughs> and I will get there. Anyways, it's more boys than girls, right? One in 42 boys and one in 189 girls. So, could it be the could one of the 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 ways that autism is being diagnosed affect the data that we're seeing, the gender gap data? Yes, and so. Recent research has suggested that there's a lot to learn about girls and how they exhibit autism, and that right now we are learning much more about how autism signs and symptoms manifest in girls. And the current diagnostic tools we have were developed based on boys, as the ratio is four to one, boys, boys to girls. So as we learn more about the signs and symptoms in, in girls, yeah. eventually there may be better diagnostic tools that will really focus on the symptoms in girls and we may see a change in that ratio. So is it something that is being worked on for future research perhaps? Yes, yes. There, there's research funded um, in US government uh, organizations, agencies and private organizations as well. Do you see the same trend in Africa with African children? Yes. Okay, more boys than girls? Yes. All right, so I guess uh, it's a global issue. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, we'll take the gentleman here. Hi, actually my question goes back to the concept of, uh, of our diagnosis or if a child could become unautistic. So is there a distinction between being developmentally delayed and being autistic? Mm -hmm. Because I've witnessed a child who presented issues, challenges that may be uh, synonymous with uh, autism, sensitivity to sound, uh, poor speech and minimal speech and poor social skills. And after age two, the child really took off and uh, went to pre-K and social life, cognitive abilities improved. How, how is it a child, was that, was that just developmental delays versus someone not being unautistic, if there's such a word? Yes. And how Good were you question. able to tell the difference? Good question. This uh, momentary delay, first and foremost, if you look at the pregnancy history, something would have been going on out there in, in the fetus maybe low oxygen supply, the new balaika cord twisting around the neck, minimizing blood flow to essential part, and the brain is the most sensitive component of the, of the body, mm -hmm. it'll be a delay. So if there is no enough oxygen and energy supply to a certain part of the brain, it will be delayed. Mm -hmm. When that child is delivered, most probably might be premature, and uh, maybe the child might have some other features like uh, birth trauma, you know, assisted uh, delivery, more in Africa area. Mm -hmm. Then somewhere along the line, ar around that age, the brain is still very plastic. Mm -hmm. Then during that moment, the developmental milestones will be delayed, and at the end, the child will catch up. Mm -hmm. That is the way it works. No, I've, I've seen people who have been diagnosed with autism grow out of it, so to speak, or perhaps by so much intensive therapy, they do very well. They, they lose the diagnosis. They may still be very quirky, but that doesn't mean they're autistic or introverted. That doesn't mean that they're autistic. I, I've definitely seen children like that. And certainly um, in children very early on before the age of two, some of the different developmental disabilities that might be first manifesting, you can't really distinguish autism from some of the other developmental disabilities yeah. until time goes by. And so you may see those early signs, but you need to wait to de see things develop before you can determine a diagnosis. And maybe there's a different diagnosis like language delay, intellectual disability, or other types of um, developmental issues. Then um, also, uh, these children, they do have some comorbidity. Mm -hmm. Some of them that have the uh, genetic uh, loading for clear mental health issue. Mm -hmm. The mental health symptoms might not come up at an early age. As they grow up, then the mental health uh, symptoms will start manifesting. So okay. it becomes very, a combination of two things now, uh, autism, mental health issue, 
And even if there's a traumatic brain injury, you might have a cognitive deficit, big one. You have intellectual disability all combined. Okay. So that's a multiple, it represents multiple challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So a reminder that you are tuned in to a special edition of Straight Talk Africa, the Breaking the Silence Autism Town Hall. We are tweeting live. Follow us at Linor Moudou on Twitter. That's Linor Moudou. That's my name. And to join in on today's town hall with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Talk Autism. We are on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of VOA. Away. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, but first, let's hear from another mother who's breaking the silence on autism from Côte d'Ivoire. Her name is Béni Blondine Yao. She shares her experience on how difficult it was for her husband's family to accept their situation. Take a look. It was difficult for the family, especially his paternal family, because they had never experienced such a case before. But with time, everybody sort of adopted him. At home, life is not easy. Feeding him is not easy. He is four now, and he is still not walking. He cannot move by himself and has to be carried all the time. Some nights, he does not sleep, and I have to work the next morning. So it's not easy. All right, Morenike, I'd like to come to you. Let's talk about research. Yes. And I wanted to know from you, from a parent's perspective, but also someone on the spectrum, yes. what would you like to see in terms of research in the future that is very much needed now? Uh, one thing I definitely would like to see is, um, as you, you all were discussing earlier, um, the disparities in um, gender with regard to, um, you know, women and non-binary individuals um, not being diagnosed as early as others, also um, other people from marginalized communities, people of color. I'd like to see more research that's, that's um, culturally competent and addresses that. Um, I'd really love to see more research um, that addresses things that people need to live, so um, augmentative communication, because some people People are non-speaking, or you know, either primarily non-speaking or, or occasionally, and to have you know innovations in that way to give people their voice. You know, we don't all have to speak to communicate. Behavior is communication. I'd love to see growth in that capacity. Um, I'd love to see some things in terms of um, integrating um, people. You know, because we want to have an inclusive society. People should have a right to be integrated into society and be themselves. So, um, looking at mental health issues, looking at um, the lifespan. So, looking at um, issues related to employment, um, looking at addressing uh, mental health issues. Um, some of the things that the one mother mentioned with regard to the, her son's um, you know, muscles, you know, when we look at things like um, hypotonia and um, certain conditions that have been you know, mentioned that are, that are more common or that you know, people are predisposed to who are on the spectrum, um, looking into those things as well. Things to improve our lives, but not wasting research dollars to try to find a cure. You, if you're autistic, you're autistic. That's who you are. Let's build on who you are, let's not try to eliminate who you are. Now, Dr. Freeman, what would you like to see in terms of research in the alternative medicine uh, world, given that a lot of people have, are struggling in terms of uh, trusting alternative mm. medicine, complementary medicine? What, would you, what type of research would you like to see that could perhaps uh, bring more trust into your field? To your field? So it's actually kind of hard to get research into natural treatments because they're so age old, right? The, the herbs have been around. It's not going to make anyone any money. <laughs> uh, you know, and, yes. and unfortunately, money kind of inspires yes. research. Sadly. So with that, but that, with that in mind, I would say that it would be awesome, I think, for what she said, the augment, augmentative communication. Because of what I think is that these children are diagnosed as mentally retarded on some level, like there's lower IQ, but once they are able to type or to express themselves, they're actually geniuses. Now they may be just a genius in math and not in language or, you know, but because they present differently, because they're nonverbal or act very strange in terms of the stereotypical behaviors, people don't give them credit until mm -hmm. they see them kind of type out 
-hmm. in some cases whole books. Mm -hmm. There are children who have written, or adults, who have written entire books mm -hmm. using one finger. If you mm -hmm. can imagine the challenge, if you have motor yes. difficulties, to write yes. an entire book with one finger. Wow. But they're brilliant, brilliant, yes. brilliant. The issue is they can't get their motor skills to express yes. that yeah. all the way. And so to me, their challenge is this kind of neurodiversity. Absolutely. And getting people to recognize their intelligence and to accept them to a school with an aide who's yes. with them to help them to give them a break exactly. when other children are still able to keep going to work. Yes. So it, it's, they've got a long road. I feel like it's kind of like where blacks were back yes, in the 60s. I feel, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, yes. It's unfortunate. Dr. Daniels, what is the current priority in terms of research on autism or perhaps future priority for the NIH? And so the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee that I manage through the NIH and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services in the U.S. has a strategic plan that names priorities for several areas of research, including research on diagnostic tools, biology of autism, risk factors, interventions, services, adult issues, lifespan, and infrastructure. And so the IACC has set up a number of different priority areas. And one of them that we touched on today was autism in women and girls. Very important, uh, definitely, given the gender gap. Now let's turn to the audience. I, had, I saw a few hands up earlier. So please, let's continue with uh, Abigail. <laughs> you choose. <laughs> I think we've talked about um, so many different areas now, um, what to look out for, the diagnostics, some of the therapies that you can give to uh, children who are, uh, but we haven't talked about school and I think a lot of um, issues for parents of children on, uh, who have autism is how do I support my child through school? Yeah. Yes, that's a good question, very straightforward. <laughs> what do they do? You have to be the biggest advocate known to man. And you have to go in and kind of stand mm -hmm. up for them because, again, they can't speak for themselves often. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go in and say, this is, I know how my child learns. Mm -hmm. Or this is, is this working or this is not? Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine how overwhelmed oh, the school okay. system must be, if you don't speak up, no one, no one will. So you, it, it really does come down to advocating for your child, as you have to do with any child you have. But this one needs probably extra extra help. I'm really glad that you brought up the school issue because you know there's been a lot of research that looks at um, students with disabilities, particularly students of color with disabilities, and the increased rate of disciplinary action that that is imposed upon them. Um, we know there are a lot of problems, and that tr that ends up trans translating into the greater society with regard to the criminal justice system. But specifically in the schools, with my own children, there I've had to pull them out of school. I've had to be that parent, those IEP meetings, um, challenge IEP meetings, and um, asking and bringing documentations. And and, and so forth and sometimes you've got some I'm an educator myself you know I, I'm a college faculty and so um, and I used to work in K through 12 so I understand as someone with a graduate degree in special education I understand that it's challenging but ultimately um, with the with IDEA and with the ADA they have a right to a free appropriate public education in the setting of you know the least restrictive setting and they have a right to be um, inclus included with their um, non-disabled peers and schools try to find these ways to wiggle around around that, oh, okay, well, we'll put them in 15 minutes of music class in the corner, you know, and then in the special ed class the rest of the time. I, my children, none of my children right now are in public school for that reason, despite that I'm a, the fact that I'm a taxpayer, because of the fact that I couldn't, they were not being properly accommodated. And there are a lot of parents, I know some autistic parents, non-autistic parents, who are homeschooling for this very reason. Um, there are private special needs segregated schools that are, you know, the cost of an annual salary for children and, and that don't have them integrating with typical developing peers, so there, it's a huge issue. Very, very big issue. Let's, let's take another qu question from the audience. Susan, right here. Susan, please here. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Susan Quizera. I have a foundation um, in Uganda. And uh, my question goes to you, uh, Dr. Osifo. Since you have a, a school in Africa, um, a lot of challenges uh, regard schools and programs for these children. Like we said before, there is nothing as in school or um, an, uh, a body in the country or in the government. You know, these children has no voice at all. So what challenges have you uh, seen or come 
um, come across, across you yeah, know, yes. uh, into that area? And how did you do it? Because I personally am into that area mm -hmm. of putting up a school, but okay. it's kind of so complicated to right. go through. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to comment on what uh, Mr. Nairo has said. Mm -hmm. You talk about school teachers mm -hmm. and the difficulty experience how with the teachers mm -hmm. and the difficulties the children have in the school. I would like to say that the teachers are trying out there yes. as well, very yes, much trying. Yes, you know, there is a problem of placement. You cannot give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. In a class where you have 25 kids and five of them have challenges, it's tough for the teacher. Yeah. And maybe that teacher is not actually trained. They, they don't know what to do. So you can't give what you don't have. So the system needs to so do that is it. better no, that in these issue. schools yes. and in these teachers yes. so that they'll have what so is that needed. Is it. Then the issue, we also have a, a consultory school facilities in the US, actually not only in Africa. Now, first is training, manpower. Are they trained? Do they have, do they have the competency, the skills? It's not that they should have PhD. No, it's not okay. about PhD. Are they trained? Training is important for those in Africa, particularly, and also in the US. So I'm surprised if I go to a school district. Okay. School teachers don't know what to do. That's number one. Two, let's go back to Africa. Very quickly. Money. No money. Money, yes. Communication system. It's okay. Not there. We're, we're running out of time, yeah. Natasha. Okay. <laughs> so, if you want to finish quick, real quick, money, you talked about money, training, what else is there? Uh, energy. Uh, okay. No light. Okay. You can, you can give any knowledge to the child, you can support the child. Supporting the child. No policy. Mm. Well, this the is a big one. Good governance is not there. Mm. No political will. Okay. So, and speaking on that, uh, no. uh, Dr. Daniels, given that NIH is a is an, a government institution, how how can the government? How, what kind of advice would you give, perhaps, uh, governments to to help in, f through your experience, the way your program is set up? What can other governments learn from it? Well, something that's um, pretty special about our government is that we have this interagency autism coordinating committee that was set up by our Congress to help us bring public input into the government process. And okay. this has been very helpful to hear from members of, of the public about the things that are really important to them to help guide government efforts. So it's perhaps a special task force or something along those lines. And I thank you so much. I'm going to leave you, give you the last final word in 10 seconds. What would you like to say, Morenike? Um, what I would like to say is that um, we're, you know, difference is a part of who humans are. So um, it's nothing to be pitied. It's nothing to fear. It's, um, it's something to try to understand and accept. Very good. And uh, to our audience, we thank you so much for joining us here in our studio. We hope you were empowered, informed, and inspired on the question of autism. Dr. Daniels, thank you so much thank you. for coming. Dr. Shisha, we appreciate your time. Thank you so and thank you, Dr. Freeman and Maureen Ike. Thank you. On that note, thanks to all our panelists, uh, Susan Daniels, the Director of the Office of Autism Research Coordination at the National Institute of Mental Health, at the National Institute of Health, based here in the nation's capital. Dr. Sifo Edward Ashisha is Clinical Director of the International Training Center for Applied Behavior Analysis located in Lagos, Nigeria. Dr. Tracy Freeman, a holistic physician based in Washington, D.C., who also serves as the chief medical advisor at BB&R Wellness Consulting. And finally, Mohenike Jiwa Onaiwu, who is on the autism spectrum and is the Autism and Race Committee Chair for the Autism Women's Network. Thank you all for joining us today for this very important discussion on autism. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, Shaka Sali returns as Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari meets with President Donald Trump at the White House on Monday, April 30th. Shaka and his guests will discuss their meeting and current U.S.-African relations. That's next week on Straight Talk Africa. Thanks for tuning in to this special edition of Straight Talk Africa. I'm Lenore Mudu. Have a good evening.